So the first time I really became aware of the caretake area was actually uh, tech. When we lived in Dayton, we were on our way to my house to work on our band's music or whatever. And um, tech was really into uh, reading the music blogs and staying on top of stuff at that time. And uh, he had read about this album in Tiny Mixtapes, and he played for me um, uh, long-term remote from the album, Persistent Repetition of Phrases. And it was just like, you know, it's almost like proto New World or whatever, because it was just this perfect chord progression, um, just like the most emotive part of a song that Leland Kirby had sort of snipped and just looped ad nauseum, like, you know, music concrete and just drenched in reverb. And it was just so indulgent. Um, and it, w when it first started, I, I remember just thinking like, oh my God, what is this track? And then text like, oh yeah, like you're really going to love this because it's just the same thing again and again for like five minutes. I was like, holy shit, who is this? So Leland Kirby, actually, um, the way that he uses samples, you know, that was super influential on me um, at a time in which I wasn't using samples at all. You know, this was like 2007 or whatever. So, you know, Vaporwave didn't exist in any form. And, you know, I still felt um, in my heart of hearts that I had to do everything originally from scratch. But the thing about The Caretaker was it's like haunted ballroom music, like in order for it to exist, you know, it's not you couldn't just write that music and then record it and then have it sound like that and have it be the same thing. It's like the natural deterioration of of the media itself creating all of those great hisses and pops and you know that only worked because that music was so old physically but also that this the style had become so antiquated. So I think it's really interesting because it's like the music of the caretaker can only exist in the time that it was actually created because it's only at that point that its samples from that frame of reference are super antiquated, um, both not only in the, the physical medium, but also um, just in their in their style. So when you hear, you know, like um, like a Dixieland era um, pop tune or, um, a, you know, a late romantic um, piece of classical music that's uh, sort of dressed um, by Leland Kirby, you know, your mind is is placing that music on the timeline of the sort of Western music canon. And I think that's that was the first time that sampling really felt justified to me. When, and I listened to it and I was like, because this music is so old, it's speaking something to me. It's contributing to this greater narrative that, that Leland Kirby is exploring here. You know, the, the project really started as an exploration of um, sort of terrifying themes that were more based in the supernatural and I mean you know the genre was haunted ballroom music and you know it was inspired by that last shot from The Shining where Jack Torrance who is the caretaker you know of the Overlook Hotel you know becomes trapped in the portrait and becomes one of the many you know evil spirits that that haunt the hotel but if you watch that scene you know it's you can hear this ballroom mu music being played you know somewhere far away kind of echoing through the empty halls and just that sound inspired the entire project and then for that to sort of turn into this exploration of um you know mental deterioration and aging and dementia and alzheimer's and sort of all of these really um horrifying concepts that are grounded in reality I think that's one of the most interesting things about the sort of direction that the um, that the caretaker went. Then if you're going to talk about um, everywhere at the end of time, you really have to talk about an empty bliss beyond this world. Um, because that was really kind of, I feel like, the turning point for Leland Kirby. Because I think that the, care the caretaker series up to that point had definitely explored these ideas of um, the mind deteriorating and, and losing memory and things like that. And it sort of had gotten there from that sort of supernatural beginning, almost as more like, you know, um, like a simulator more than an actual album or a concept album. And I think that that really kind of hit full pitch with An Empty Bliss Beyond This World. I remember really being struck by how kind of focused um, his telling of that story and his construction of that simulation was. Um, you know, there was just a small pool of melodies that sort of 
came back as the album progressed and it was really the the concept of everywhere at the end of time but in a sort of much smaller package um so as the album progressed you would hear melodies from the beginning of the album but maybe just the left channel would be cutting in and out you know like a memory engram that's slowly deteriorating and sort of um falling away and that was another album that i sort of just completely um, just let take over my life. Like just one of those albums, you, you know, those albums where there's just like a year that the album comes out that you just like, you listen to it like 10,000 times and it's just, it's always okay. It's always what you want to hear um, for whatever reason. I don't know, maybe I was in a dark place. And so when Everywhere at the End of Time um, was first announced and came out, it was like, holy shit, here we go. Like this is the caretaker magnum opus. It's... Um, you know, those ideas from uh, uh, An Empty Bliss, but just really blown out um, to an extreme that had never been seen before. And it was great for me, too, because another reason why I've always admired Leland Kirby's work is that he's really willing to indulge himself with these concepts. And, um, you know, he's never been concerned with accessibility um, at all. And I think that the length of his albums is another way that he sort of leans in on that. Um, I mean, that's the reason why I made uh, Dare Like Mega Tower was originally inspired by the fact that, um, you know, Leland Kirby had made an album that was just shy of four hours. Um, and I wanted to beat that, you know, so that was something that kind of um, inspired me personally. And so I think that everywhere at the end of time is really kind of the final punctuation of that sort of, um, just unwilling to restrain himself. Um, and so now we're left with this album when I don't even know if you add them all together, it's something like five or six hours long, you know? Um, I mean, what a perfect final statement uh, for the caretaker. I don't know, I feel like he feels like any other artist would feel like, okay, I had this great concept. It got really popular. So I went in and I continued to do it, but now I'm kind of tired of it and want to move on to the next thing. I don't think that there's any other sort of corner of this concept that, um, that is left to explore for him. So I'm just excited to see what he does next.